uh, that way we can be an influence and, and an influence uh, in terms of evangelizing can be simply inviting someone, you know, and, and maybe a person who's more uh, knowledgeable, more skilled can, can take over the role of the teacher, you know, like a handoff, like a relay. So I think that many people are still um, a little bit more uh, inhibited in their, in their confidence levels. So we try to uh, help people see how, you know, you can start out talking about the tomatoes in your backyard. You can talk about whatever it is, but everything can parlay uh, into a discussion of the scriptures. Everything does. Jesus used every kind of example possible to teach. And I think we look at, at that example and we see this is, this is probably uh, and will always be maybe our more underutilized asset. We all know that this world is full of problems. With fearful news and negativity at every turn, it's even hard for Christians not to get discouraged. So I invite you to join us as we focus on the good that's happening all around and discuss how we can be blessed and bless others, especially in troubling times. Encouraging each other is a huge task. It's a team sport which requires a team lift so we can build each other up and restore unity and hope to the church. Even Jesus needed help carrying his cross. You're not alone, and we're here to show you just that. All glory to God. And so the brethren are so excited that, that there's just more encouragement to understand that there are more people like them and that we, uh, we want to uh, engage with them in different ways. So all of that's been wonderful. That's been great. You haven't asked me a single question. <laughs> I've just, just been running my mouth. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. We're just visiting. We'll get started here in a second if you're ready. But, but yeah. Oh, okay. I'm ready. I'm ready yeah. whenever you're ready. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, if you're ready, let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Okay. Our most holy Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you, your almighty power, your wisdom, your majesty. We're so thankful, so blessed to be your children. We know, Lord, that there are so many problems in this world and, and that there's so many people that are discouraged and, and that are suffering or feeling isolated. We pray, Lord, your blessings upon them. We pray, Lord, that this talk will reach far and wide, that it will do your business, that it would be an uplifting thing for those who are, who are seeking encouragement. We know, Lord, that it is the mission of the church to edify one another as well as to teach. We pray, Lord, that we can do both through this avenue of this technology. We pray your blessings upon Johnny and upon myself at this time, that we can continue to do your work all the days of our lives and that we would be faithful and that we would continue to stand up for and, and stand up and, and pass the righteousness and in truth and, and to defend your word, to, to defend the faith. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of technology that we can meet this way, that we can talk about spiritual things and encouraging things. We pray your blessings upon us now. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, Johnny, my my long long time brother in christ i i met you i'm not sure uh, exactly when i think it was probably in 2010 when i when i moved over to the houston area and and um at, at some of the lectureships there and in, in, in pensacola and so glad to see you we've been working together for many years and i've been helping you with with putting some books together for the english lectures that you go to every absolutely year. Yes, yes. So Johnny Oxendine, thank you so much for being here with me. And, and where are you at now? And, and what congregation do you worship with? I am in San Mateo, California, and the congregation is the Church of Christ San Mateo. Been here for um, a number of years in San Mateo itself, over 40 years. I've been the preacher at the congregation for the last 24, 25 years. Uh, it's a small congregation. It's in a very liberal part of the country and in a, in a very liberal part of the state. So it's it's one of those uh, it's one of those things you feel like you're always working on a mission field, which is fantastic. Yes, yeah, one of my dreams to be to to work in the mission field, and and it's uh, such a wonderful thing that you can do that right in your own home. Uh, so in, in a few minutes, so what led you to obey the gospel? 
Well, what led me to obey the gospel? That's a, a story that I told the congregation and, and various people over the, over the years. Uh, when I was in college, I met this uh, young lady and she was my girlfriend. And then after college, I was in New York with a friend. Uh, we hadn't seen each other for a while, but I was in New York with a friend. We were at the New York Jazz Festival. And we were at the New York Jazz Festival and we were trying to uh, get into this particular um, concert, Thelonious Monk and Keith Jarrett. It was sold out. I said, okay, I'm gonna go over to Newark, New Jersey, uh, see an old girlfriend. I went over there, had a flat tire. <clears throat> Uh, and I met her mother, who was the, the most uh, calm and at peace person I had ever met in my life. Uh, she immediately began to tell me about the church. She said, if you're going to come see my daughter, you're going to go with us to church. I said, no, that's not happening. <laughs> but she was, she, was, she was wonderful. She was very calm. She was, very, she was at peace. She began to talk to me about the church and she said, you know, when you go back to Maryland, which is where I was living, she said, I want you to look up the Church of Christ. And she gave me a list of questions. She said, call them up, ask these questions. And if they answer certain in a certain way, she said that that will be a place that you should go and visit. So I, I did that. I took those questions and I called a place which was really not very far from where I was living at the time, uh, University Park. Uh, Hyattsville, Maryland Church of Christ. And I went there and I began to listen. I went on Sundays, I went on Wednesdays. And I began to hear the Bible in a completely different way than I'd ever thought about it. And I began to listen to what was said and it was interesting and I continued to go and go and go. But I was also planning to leave because my uh, plans at the time as a, as a young 20 some year old, I was gonna move to uh, Denmark. But uh, I was first going to go to live in California for a few years. So long story short, I headed out to California and came to San Mateo, where a friend of my girlfriend's lived, and began to visit the church in San Mateo. And that's where it all started. One of the elders uh, there began to study with me. He set an example for me in a number of ways, uh, Brother A.P. Spurlock. He and his wife would have me into their homes. Uh, almost every day, we would do Bible study, almost every day for three, four hours a day for the longest period of the time, which always sort of remains in my memory as the way that I'd like to be able to serve if someone had that need to be able to, to extend myself like that, like he did for me. I mean, his wife had come from work. Uh, he helped me move once. Uh, I'd come from work and, and go up to his home, and his wife, Sadie, would, would fix meals for us. Uh, we study for at least three hours every night. Eventually, after several months of study, which tells you how much I knew, <laughs> which was nothing, uh, I was baptized and began to uh, uh, attend in San Mateo. Noah Hackworth was the preacher at the time. Uh, and Noah, of course, held classes for the young men. Uh, the elders sort of, they sort of allow the church there to have its own sort of pre-training program where the elders uh, work with the young men within the congregation. Uh, and, and Noah worked with us in Greek and a lot of other, you know, sermon preparation, all these things. And then he would take us out to various congregations that would allow us to come <laughs> and, and give a little five, ten minute uh, lessons prepping us, you know, getting us ready to learn how to preach. You know, we were, we were probably horrible at the time, but it was a lot of fun, the camaraderie, the fellowship, getting an opportunity to go and, and preach the lessons. And, and so was there until, of course, Noah, after 30 years, uh, decided to take on a work down in Visalia, California, <clears throat> ask if I would be uh, willing to uh, take on the work in San Mateo. The congregation was was uh, willing to let me do that, and I've been there ever since. Wow! Wow! What an incredible story, and how you know something that you know one thing leads to another, and and you, you find find the Bible, and you know when we start actually reading it, it's just it's just an amazing thing how it can just open our eyes, and and like you said, it's 
that's something that I, I, I always strive to be, uh, strive to do as, as you said, that, that brother, that the elder, now, I, I want to be an elder one day. That's my, that's my goal in life and, and have that availability, have the hospitality to, to, and, and the, the, the foresight to see, okay, this brother needs, or this individual needs some, some guidance, some study, some patience, you know, all these things. But so many times I think that, um, we, we sell our young people short and we say, oh, they're never going to listen or, or something like that and, and never give them really the, the time, the patience that's needed to, to, to plant those seeds. Well, that, that initial meeting with uh, uh, this lady, her name was uh, Gertha Alston, and just her patience. And I, and I thought to myself when I was listening to her, I said, never met anyone as patient as this. And yeah. of course, I was in my 20s. I wasn't very patient at the time. And you know, she told me those, when she told me there's only one church, I almost fell out of the chair. I said, let me get the phone book here. Let me show you. There's a lot more. Um, but she began to talk about the various uh, characteristics of the church and, and everything. And, and then when I got to um, the church in Hyattsville and just sat there and listened and everything was from the Bible, it wasn't some you know, long stories or yawns. It was, it was just from the Bible. And, and he began to, uh, I believe the preacher's name at the time was Kaufman. And I think he was from Texas, but I can't be certain. Uh, but just the way that he preached, it was straight from the Bible. He, he made the application so clear, so easily understandable. And it just caught my interest. Obviously I was, I was needing that in my life. Uh, but I not only went on Sundays, but I also went on Wednesdays. You know, they tried to get me in a Bible class. I said, look, I'm working a full-time job. I'm here Sunday when I just don't have time. But once I got to San Mateo, um, then a great group of young people there at the time uh, invited me to all the things that they did, all their activities. And it was great. I met a, a host of characters. And I thought that was interesting was that the people who are in this church are very normal. They're very normal people. They're you know, some of them are funny, some of them are crazy, some of them are this, you know, everything. But but yeah. they all had one uh, thing that tied them all together, and that was their uh, appreciation, their love for the scriptures. And so that's uh, what drew me in. Amen. Yeah, it's it's wonderful, wonderful that we can have family wherever we go. You know, that that we we have all this uh, together in common. So th thinking back this year, what is um, something that you've learned that's really helped you grow? Well, what I've learned this year is that uh, we can overcome uh, any type of adversity. I mean, this year has been a crazy year with COVID, hasn't it? And it's yeah. the kind of thing that uh, could probably uh, keep people uh, isolated and separated, but we've been able to overcome all of that. Uh, whether there have been restrictions. I mean, look at us today. We're talking across the country on Zoom. You know, I mean, things like that have made uh, me more encouraged that the church may be uh, moving toward a place where we can actually use technology in a, in, in a more effective way. Uh, not just Zoom, but but Zoom and, and you know, Google Meet and all those things. You know, I've been talking, I was talking with a brother some years ago, and we were trying, this was five, six years ago or more, we we're talking about how can the church use technology to engage? Uh, you have all these things that people you see in the world that they are involved in, whether it's Snapchat or Instagram, all these different things. What are the venues where the church can actually uh, make some sort of impact in people's lives? Uh, not just as a splash, like another flashy thing, but something that will actually get people more uh, engage with the scriptures, aware of the scriptures, things like that. So the encouragement this year is that regardless of, of the situation that we find ourselves faced with now, uh, it's been encouraging that, that we've been able to not only uh, strengthen one another, uh, but actually in many instances, uh, increase the congregation size. We've actually had some baptisms and so that's been great, yeah. Uh, wonderful. wonderful, and uh, Kind of going off that that same vein there, this year has been such a whirlwind. It's it's you know everyone's ready for 2021 because 2020 has been 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 such a rocky year for so many people. They're ready to get it over with. 
but but there's been so many good things happening too. Like you said, there's some baptisms we had, church growth, all these opportunities. What what's a positive experience or, or some some good news that you can share with us that you've had this year? Well, I think baptism during the COVID is is one thing that that really is uh, exciting. I mean, who would expect things like that to take place? Uh, not being able to go out, people wearing masks, people afraid of getting ill, uh, and, and worse. <clears throat> I think that's been encouraging that we've been able to uh, see as a result. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, one of the things that we we noticed that was that the, the membership had such a hunger to get back together that once we had the opportunity to get back in, uh, into the building to meet, to the fellowship, uh, I think that's one of the things there that we saw uh, that was really exciting. You know, I, I mentioned it last Sunday, I said just being able to look around, see your faces, you know, the, the fact that you're sitting in these seats, of course, socially distanced, but you're sitting in these seats, um, that's an encouragement to everyone. Uh, that we haven't let anything like that hold us back, hold us down. I mean, we've had some little bumps along the way. We've lost some people, uh, they've moved, or we've had some people uh, who passed during this year, but uh, we've maintained uh, and continue to move forward with optimism. I think optimism is, is the thing that we've, we've seen most. Wonderful, wonderful. It's, it's such a, an amazing thing to see even times like this when we think everything's falling apart. There's people that are searching, there's people that are seeking and, and to use those opportunities to have. And the only way you can use those opportunities is to be optimistic and, and to be ready for them. Well, I, I don't really understand uh, a Christian viewpoint taking any other path than optimism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just don't, I don't understand how that would be possible uh, for a faithful Christian to not be optimistic. Uh, we have hope. We have that hope. Uh, and we know that this is just a small part of the journey, isn't it? We're pilgrims on right. this. And, and so the idea of being uh, discouraged, I mean, you may be discouraged, but um, I, I really don't see that as, as part of my mixture, is, is letting things get us down too long. Uh, there's... The upside is what? God is in control. And when we understand and recognize that, nothing can keep us back. Well said. I, I really like that. So if you're thinking back, I, I know you're, you've been preaching for, for quite a while now. I'm sure you've, you've read many, many books. Uh, and other than the Bible, what are some books that, that have most impacted your life? <laughs> well... <clears throat> Because I was a art critic for a few years, and I grew up in a home where my father, not only my, well, my mother and father were teachers, my mother was a music teacher. Uh, we had a music school. My father was a painter and sculptor. Uh, so the arts were sort of around me all the time. I, I was more, um, I leaned toward literature. I think my favorite books, uh, you ask for the one or three favorite books or something like that. And I think my favorite book outside of the scriptures, of course, would be uh, a book by uh, Marcel Proust, Remembrance of Things Past or In Search of Lost Time is one translation of it. Um, it's a book that's probably 4,000 pages, uh, usually takes a good year or so to read, uh, if not more. Uh, it took me more the first time, maybe three years, because I take extensive notes. Uh, but it was, it's a story of a man who, as a result of something that uh, happens when he dips uh, a, a cake, a French cake, uh, into tea and tastes it, then everything sort of lifts up like out of a relief uh, into his memory. So it's going back into his memory, it covers some 50 years. And it's an awareness of um, the most minute details of art, of uh, theater, of uh, comp music composition. Uh, it's, a, it's a criticism really of um, arrogance uh, throughout the book. And so it, it's fascinating. And uh, I'm not gonna ask anyone to try to read it because most of the sentences are about half a page long each sentence. So. 
uh, but it's a it's a marvelous book. Uh, another book that was uh, fascinating and important was Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, uh, who of course uh, great American writer, uh, and it's his uh, signature work. Uh, very influential in, in just the way to think about things, uh, and of course uh, Moby Dick uh, by Herman Melville. Uh, great uh, abolitionist uh, novel, actually, uh, and sort of pre presaged that with uh, Benito Sereno, which was a smaller novella, but speaks also to the uh, abolitionist intent. So those are three of, I, I could give many different books, uh, whether they were art books or just a lot of different things, deconstruction, whatever, but I'll, I'll use those three. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to, have to check out some of those. Uh, that one, that sounds very interesting. So thinking back in, in your life, thinking about. Oh, um, oh and, and I have to put in um, uh, two, po two poetry uh, pieces. One is uh, Dante, of course, uh, The Divine okay. Comedy and, and okay. Milton's Paradise Lost. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. Those are fascinating books themselves there. All right. Thank you for those. Thank you for those. Um, what thinking back on your life, uh, we've all had ups and downs, and and um, thinking back on some of your past failures or or parent failures. Do you have Do you have any um, failures that have set you up for a later success? Well, I had uh, a, a number of those. I think we all have uh, some failures that help us. We we so, we're supposed to learn from those. And I think one of the things that I learned from was an experience that I had that uh, very dangerous. Um, and it taught me to obey my parents. <laughs> um, many years ago, I was uh, at home with a friend and my parents were gone. And my father, he uh, always had um, uh, different handguns and shotguns and things like that around the house and we were fooling around with one of the handguns and this friend of mine uh, just had to make he made this motion with his hand and and the gun went off inside the house mm -hmm. and the bullet sort of ricocheted in the corner and and came and we had a clock that was right uh across the corner, so it ricocheted in the corner and came and stuck in the clock. Didn't shatter the clock, amazingly, but stuck in the clock. Uh, scared both of us, of course, to death. Either one of us could have been hit with the bullet from the ricochet. Uh, my parents never knew that this happened. Uh, they never really looked behind the clock. And when we did move, I don't think that they even noticed it at the time. <clears throat> So I, I, I learned from that experience um, in, in, a, in a weird way, you know, the value of life, I think that was one of the things that, that I learned. Um, other failures, uh, I think a, a failure would be the, I would think just not taking in all of the opportunities to learn from people who were older than I was uh, when I was younger, sort of dismissing and as a young person might do, thinking that that you know more than they do. I think those kinds of things, <clears throat> that, would, that would be one of the things that I would look back on and say, that was a mistake. That was a mistake, yeah. Okay. Now you can kind of see those things and, and uh, help help yourself you know, to make, make sure that you can impress on others to, to listen to, to those who are, who have more wisdom than they do? Well, I try to pause now more than I used to. I used, I used to probably be somewhat like Peter, a little impulsive, mm -hmm. um, but I'm a little less impulsive now. I, I don't know if that's wisdom, age, a combination or, or neither. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, do you have any uh, any quotes that you think of often or that you live your life by? You know, actually, uh, very few quotes. Um, I do have to say that, you know, in 
Philippians, it's, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I think that's the quote that sort of comes to mind, uh, understanding that uh, nothing can really prevent the Christian from uh, succeeding and succeeding in a spiritual way. I think if we focus on that type of success, um, everything else is, uh, is before us. Uh, if that's our goal is to prosper spiritually, um, I think then we'll be pleasing to God. Amen. Amen. I know the, the Bible has a treasure trove of, of quotes that we, that we do live our lives by and, and so thankful for those indeed. We have so many people here we talked about earlier. Uh, there's a lot of feeling of isolation, a lot of feeling of discouragement. It seems like when one thing we're finally getting over something or getting used to something, something else happens and just, just puts us back goes on in life. Yeah. 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 So what kind of advice can you give someone struggling, a struggling Christian today? Well, my advice for a struggling Christian uh, really falls into two areas that aren't novel or unique in my uh, thinking about them. Uh, one is to work on strengthening one's prayer life. And the other is the daily attention to the scriptures. Uh, this is one of the things I know everyone in every congregation has people who encourage along those lines. Uh, if you strengthen your prayer life and if you strengthen your uh, searching of the scriptures on a, you know, with regularity, uh, you, you begin to take on a different perspective. And I think that the things that are troubling people, the things that uh, discourage people, I think the things that even to those who find themselves depressed, um, those things can all be vanquished by uh, a deeper appreciation of God's word. Uh, certainly uh, the engagement communication through prayer, uh, always looking uh, at ways that we can improve ourselves uh, and simply thinking about the struggles that have been made uh, before us by those who were in the Old and New Testament in order to allow us to appreciate the blessings that we have. So I think uh, those are the two things I would say, prayer and study of the scriptures, uh, to bring anyone out of any kind of uh, doomsday attitude that they might have. I think that, that that's where you start. Yes, yes, it's, it's so important. It's so, uh, I shouldn't say obvious, but, but it is, you know, in a sense that we know we're supposed to be doing these things and we need that reminder. And then when we actually do them, you know, there's always, it doesn't matter how, how good you are at praying, or how often you pray or how, how much you read the scripture, there's always more that we can do, more that we can learn and benefit from. And, and it's something that we always have to go back to the basics. It never ends. That's right. That's it right. never ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know you're a man of many hats. You wear lots of hats uh, and, and have lots of responsibilities. And I'm sure there's times when you feel overwhelmed or get unfocused. What, what are some of the things that you do when, when you lose your focus temporarily to get back on track? <laughs> well, I, I don't generally feel overwhelmed. I feel that there's just a lot more on my plate and how do I manage that? Um, so it's a matter of trying to put things into, you know, I guess those each little compartment, compartmentalize and try to deal with this and deal with that and deal with that. I guess that we all, I, I shouldn't say that um, there's not, I shouldn't say that there's not a feeling of being overwhelmed from time to time because that's how stress enters in, isn't it? Um, I guess I just try to pause and see what needs to be done and, and take one thing at a time, try to prioritize, uh, look at what's um, the most immediate needs and, and, and move that way. Usually what, what's, what needs to be done first, go from there. Um, now, of course, with a wife, they always have a whole nother list of things that you have to add to. <laughs> and, and, and so that, that's also part of it. So you, you have things that you have to do for your family. Yeah. And then you have things that you have to do uh, first for the Lord and then for your family. 
uh, and then you have your job. And so I think naturally we, we, we sort of learn how to do that. Uh, some people have a little bit more trouble doing that than others. Some people aren't really taught how to do that. There's certain things uh, people simply aren't taught. Uh, you can imagine what that would be like if a child was never taught how to do certain things. You know, that's what a parent's role is. So I think we sort of learn as we grow to manage ourselves and the people who have difficulty with that, uh, we try to, you know, intervene and help them see this is what will make your life a little easier. This would relieve stress. You know, we, we've often talked about what we see with Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount and where he talks about, you know, not to worry, that command not to worry. And he talks about the things that, people worry about and he says these are the things that the gentiles are concerned about our our priority is to focus on him to focus on his word to do his will if that's what we do then a lot of these other things become uh second uh, second nature uh easy and less important mm -hmm. so i think again the focus goes back to what does the bible teach us to do excellent Excellent. So thinking of all the good things we have going for the church these days, what's, what's some of the best things? What's the best thing that we have going for the church that we're not taking advantage of or that we're underutilizing? Well, I think that I, I, I don't want to speak for everyone, and I, I certainly couldn't speak for everyone because it's different in every place. Sure. Um, but I think um, things that usually need more attention uh, would be building up everyone's confidence in their ability to evangelize. Uh, everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, many people feel that they don't know the Bible well enough. They don't know from Genesis to Revelation. They can't verbatim, punctuate them, quote all the scriptures. Uh, so we try to encourage everyone to understand how they have various, I'll use that term and you don't understand when I say talents. Everyone has ways that they are able to communicate with other people uh, about different things. And you can, you can utilize those things that you know that you enjoy. Uh, you can utilize those as a way in. You know? And the idea, of course, what we're wanting to do is to make friends. Uh, we're not looking for notches on our belt, how many people, that, you know, but what we want to do is make more friends. When we make more friends, uh, and they begin to uh, trust us. They begin to uh, look at our lives. They begin to see how different the Christian life is from theirs. Uh, that way we can be an influence. And, and an influence uh, in terms of evangelizing can be simply inviting someone, you know, and, and maybe a person who's more uh, knowledgeable, more skilled can, can take over the role of the teacher, you know, like a handoff, like a relay. So I think that many people are still um, a little bit more uh, inhibited in their in their confidence levels. So we try to uh, help people see how, you know, you can start out talking about the tomatoes in your backyard. You can talk about whatever it is, but everything can parlay uh, into a discussion of the scriptures. Everything does. Jesus used every kind of example possible to teach. And I think we look at in that example, and we see this is, this is probably... Uh, and will always be maybe our more underutilized asset is having the confidence to actually say something. And I know in this uh, world in which we live with uh, all of the uh, radical ideologies and everything, people uh, sometimes are more muted in their um, conversation about religion or beliefs. But uh, there are so many different ways we can think about how do I move from this to the scriptures sure. and and i think that's that's what we should uh try to help people see is always available to us impossible yes yes i think it's the human element is so underutilized that that we all have our own abilities our own talents our own uh, way that we are able to connect with people and for us to not be so afraid. Oh, I can't answer. I don't, I, I have so many questions myself. How can I teach somebody the gospel and, and those sort of things? And, and it's so important for us to see, like you said, it's 
make friends first. And, and then those, those sort of things come. Well, we're social people and everyone has something that they enjoy. Everyone has something that they uh, really love and uh, taking whatever that is and being able to, you know, with the enthusiasm that we have about whatever it is, uh, be able to move from there, you know, uh, as I said, and from that point, you know, when we thought, you think about Acts chapter eight, you think about the, the, and the Ethiopian eunuch, and he said, and from that point, he began to preach to him Jesus. And so we, we have to look for that point where we can begin to preach to them Jesus. Amen. Amen. Donnie, thank you so much for taking some time today and, and talking with me. It's been such an uplifting, encouraging, encouraging thing to be able to talk with you through Zoom and, and see your face. It's been a number of years since we've, we've uh, been face to face. It has, it has, it has. And, and, I, and again, I want to thank you so much for the work that you've done uh, for us uh, with the book covers. They, they've, they've been magnificent. Uh, they have really always sort of hit the spot. Uh, and, and we look forward, you know, so I'll tell you, you know, next one is Colossians. So <laughs> I'll, right, I'll get with you when, when, we're, when we get to that point, which we're hoping will be in the spring, um, late March, early April, we're hoping that we'll be able to go over to the UK for the lectures um, to present. But if not, then <clears throat> we'll just move them to October. Uh, but anyway, yes, it's been a pleasure. I, I mean, just yeah. to see you again has been great. It's been wonderful. I'm glad you're doing this. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for helping me out here. and. And Lord willing, we'll be able to get together and, and see each other face to face real soon. Uh, I appreciate Absolutely. you so much.